Welcome back to the amino acid oxidation playlist. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the catabolic pathway for tryptophan, where it gets converted to something called 2-amino-3-carboxymuconate 6-semialdehyde. What we're going to find is that tryptophan catabolism is very complicated. It's a very lengthy pathway, so we're only going to do part of it here. And again, that's up to 2-amino-3-carboxymuconate 6-semialdehyde. Now, one thing I want to point your attention to is in tryptophan notice, we have aromaticity, right, in the R group. And my question to you is, what type of aromaticity is it? Well, if you look at this ring, you would tell me that it's an indole ring. And in fact, indole rings are doubly aromatic, right? They're a bicyclic structure, right? And both rings are actually aromatic. And my question to you is also, what is the stability of an aromatic ring? And aromatic rings, especially doubly aromatic rings, are extraordinarily stable. They're very low in energy, okay, which also tends to make them very unreactive. And part of the problem in catabolizing such an amino acid with such a stable R group is that it's so stable, right? You're going to have to really work to open up the ring and you're going to have to provide something that's really high in energy to open it up. And I want you to think back to your organic chemistry, organic one and two. And my question to you is, which aromatic ring did you tend to work with? And you worked with benzene, right? And if you wanted to get benzene to react, well, you had to provide special high energy conditions in which you had exceptional electrophiles, especially if you wanted to do an electrophilic aromatic substitution. But here's another question. Did you ever see a reaction in organic one or two where you actually completely destroyed the benzene ring? And the answer is no. You may have, you know, you may have lost aromaticity for a brief moment when you generated a sigma complex or a Meisenheimer complex, right? But you quickly regained aromaticity because aromaticity is a stabilizing effect, right? Well, you never saw a reaction where you destroyed an aromatic ring completely. But the interesting thing about this pathway, much like phenylalanine and tyrosine catabolism, is that we're actually going to completely destroy the aromatic ring. But because it's so stable being a doubly aromatic ring, we're going to have to do it in several steps. There's not just going to be one or two enzymes that destroys the whole indole ring. We're actually going to have to do it sequentially. We're going to first destroy the five-membered part of the ring, and then in, in two completely different steps, we're going to destroy the six-membered ring. Okay. And what I want to uh, first mention is that when we destroy such a stable ring, we're going to have to provide very high energy conditions. And the high energy conditions that we're going to have to use is molecular oxygen. You need to familiarize yourself with oxygen as being one of the most high energy reactive species in all of biochemistry 1 and 2. And even if you go beyond those classes and you start getting into steroid biosynthesis and bile salt synthesis, it's still going to retain its high energy reactive character. Okay, so without boring you any further with stability and aromaticity, let's actually get into the pathway. Okay. The committed and rate limiting step in tryptophan catabolism is going to be catalyzed by tryptophan 2,3 dioxygenase. Now, what's important to mention about um, these pathways is the rate limiting and committed steps tend to be catalyzed by mitochondrial enzymes. Okay, And I've asked this question before in other videos, but I'll ask it again just to get you in the habit of thinking about it. And the question is this. Why is it that these committed steps of amino acid catabolism, why is it that they exist in the mitochondrial matrix? And another follow-up question to sort of lead you into the answer is, what's a process that involves amino acids that occurs in the cytosol? And the answer is ribosomal translation, right? The process of activating amino acids using tRNA synthetases, and then the process of translating the mRNA into a protein. And so part of the beauty of how the cell works is you biochemically and, and really structurally compartmentalize the area in which you do amino acid catabolism from the area in which you do protein biosynthesis. And I think that makes sense. You don't want to be you don't want to have the area where you destroy amino acids in the same 
place where you're actually putting them together into a protein. So most of the committed steps in these catabolic pathways occur in the mitochondria and pretty much all the other enzymes do as well. And specifically, this enzyme, tryptophan 23 dioxygenase is expressed at very high concentrations in the liver hepatocytes. Okay, so it's going to incorporate both atoms of molecular oxygen into the tryptophan, and it's going to destroy the five-membered ring. And specifically, the bond that we're going to destroy is this one that I'll show in blue. This is the bond that we're going to destroy right here. And what we're going to get in the process is something called informal kynurinine. Now... Tryptophan has several fates in the cell, and we can go into that in another, in another video. But one of the fates in trip, that tryptophan can enter into is serotonin biosynthesis. And serotonin, as you might be aware of, is one of the most important neurotransmitters in your body. It's certainly responsible for good uh, mood, sleep regulation, and in the context of blood clotting and coagulation, it's a vasoconstrictor in the blood vessel system, right? But once you use this enzyme and you catabolize tryptophan into informal kynurinine, the informal kynurinine is now completely committed into tryptophan catabolism. So by using this enzyme, you absolutely ensure that tryptophan gets catabolized. Once you generate informal kynurinine, this is the point of no return for tryptophan catabolism. Now, N-formal kynurinine, which is now committed into the catabolic pathway, is going to react with a hydrolytic enzyme. And the hydrolytic enzyme specifically is going to target this carbon that I'm highlighting in orange. Okay? And effectively, that's the carbon where the nucleophilic acyl substitution will occur. And the reason this is called N-formal kynurinine is because this group right here, that I'm highlighting in yellow, that's the formal group. And so you can imagine that the rest of this molecule, which is up here, this part of the molecule is kynurinine, and it is. So that's the reason that this molecule is called informal kynurinine. And informal kynurinine formamidase is going to hydrolyze off that formal group, and it's essentially going to leave as formate, and the formate molecule is right here. Now, formate is a toxic molecule, but we have catabolic pathways to deal with that. And in another video, we'll actually look at the catabolic pathway for that. So suffice it to say for now, this formate is going to get catabolized. Okay. And of course, once we hydrolyze off the formate group or the formyl group, we get kynurinine. And this is the molecule for which the pathway is named. So because the informal kynurinine is committed to this pathway, this is called the kynurinine pathway of tryptophan degradation. Okay. So the very next enzyme that we're going to react kynurinine with is called kynurinine 3-monooxygenase. Now, if we were to look at the structure of molecular oxygen, which looks like this, and let me draw molecular oxygen as it would exist at physiological pH, molecular oxygen has two atoms of oxygen, right? One of these atoms of oxygen, which we can call this one, one of these atoms is going to get incorporated into the kynurinine, and that particular oxygen is shown right here as a hydroxyl group. The other atom of oxygen that's part of molecular oxygen gets incorporated into water. And so not only can we call this a monooxygenase, we can also call it a mixed function oxidase or a hydroxylase. So another name for this enzyme that you might often hear is kynurinine 3-hydroxylase. And the reason it's called 3-hydroxylase is because it's going to hydroxylate the 3 position on kynurinine. And so what you should end up getting out of this reaction is 3 hydroxylase kynurinine okay now we have three hydroxykynurinine and what I want to point your attention to is this we have this molecule right here and I'll do this in yellow we have this part of kynurinine right here and if I asked you what group this is well you might look at it and not be sure at first but if you look at this right here what amino acid is this well this is just L alanine right so you would call this group right here this is an alanyl group this is an alanyl group, and specifically what kynurininase is going to do is it's going to target this particular carbon in a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction, and it's going to hydrolyze off L-alanine. And so what you should be left with is this molecule right here, which is 3-hydroxyanthranilate. 
Okay. Now, the interesting thing about tryptophan catabolism is that we get 3-hydroxy anthranilate. But if we were to remove that hydroxy group and, and be left with anthranilate, the anthranilate is used to biosynthesize tryptophan. And that's not done in humans. That's done in bacteria. But it's just interesting to think about. The anthranilate is used to biosynthesize tryptophan, whereas 3-hydroxy anthranilate is a catabolic product of tryptophan catabolism. Okay, now before we actually go into the next reaction of 3-hydroxyanthranilate, let's focus on L-alanine for just a second. Now this process of course is occurring in the liver and what we have to imagine is that the alanine is going to react, oops, let me get my brush, the alanine is going to react with alanine transaminase. So this will be alanine, alanine, alanine transaminase, right? And alanine transaminase is, of course, going to use, like all transaminases, an alpha ketoglutarate. And it's going to transfer this amine group, right, onto alpha ketoglutarate. And, of course, you're going to get glutamate out of it, right? But in the process, what you're going to generate is you're going to generate pyruvate. And remember, it pains me to say this because mechanistically this is not what happens. But you can effectively think of transaminase reactions as substitutions between amines and carbonyls. And so we know this molecule is pyruvate. Okay, And this process is occurring in the liver. Now let's think about the, the fate of pyruvate that we generate through alanine transaminase. Pyruvate, assuming we're in the fasting state, is going to be shunted into gluconeogenesis by the liver. Right? So this process is going to be gluconeogenesis, right? and we should get uh, a molecule of glucose per two molecules of pyruvate. Recall that glucose is a six-carbon six molecule, right? and pyruvate is a three-carbon molecule. So if you think about all the reactions in glycolysis that occurred in the payoff phase, um, we had to do two of each of those reactions per glucose, right? Because aldolase split fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into two 3-carbon molecules. So up through, um, up through the creation of dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we're going to have to do two of each reaction. Now, pyruvate will react with pyruvate carboxylase and consume one ATP per reaction. But since we're going to have to do it twice to make one molecule of glucose, you're essentially going to have to, to burn two ATPs in two reactions of pyruvate carboxylase, which should give you oxaloacetate. But then oxaloacetate is going to have to react with PEP carboxykinase to give you phosphoenolpyruvate. Again, you'll have to do this reaction twice, and that's going to burn two GTPs, right? And then if we're reversing phosphoglycerate kinase in uh, the gluconeogenic direction, we're going to have to burn two ATPs per generation of one glucose. So in all, when we convert pyruvate to glucose, assuming we're in the fasting state, we're going to have to burn six nucleoside triphosphates. Now this is of course okay by the liver standards because remember that the liver generates most of its energy through beta oxidation, right? It's constantly burning fats and so it's going to have a constant supply of NADH through the enzyme beta hydroxyacyl coa dehydrogenase, it should have a constant supply of ubiquinol through fatty acyl coa dehydrogenase, and therefore you have fuel for the respiratory chain and the pumping of protons. And we know, of course, that that pumping of protons powers ATP synthase, and so you, and so you should have plenty of ATP floating around the cell. And so this gluconeogenic process should not be a problem for the liver. And of course, the liver is the main organ that's going to do gluconeogenesis. But anyways, let's get back to the tryptophan catabolism now that we've seen the fate of alanine in the fasting state. Okay, so we saw that kynurinase hydrolyzes off the alanyl group to make alanine from 3-hydroxykynurinine to make 3-hydroxyanthranilate. Now, what we've done essentially by hydroxylating the kynurinine ring is we've activated the benzene ring, okay? And we've raised it up in energy. Now it's high enough up in energy to where we can use a dioxygenase 
to cleave apart the ring completely. Now one thing I want to point your attention to is we have a dioxygenase here and we also had one in the first committed step of tryptophan catabolism. And we also have two dioxygenases in phenylalanine and tyrosine catabolism. Now one thing I do want to point your attention to is that when we have aromatic rings you'll t and we're doing catabolic pathways, you'll tend to see a lot of dioxygenases. A lot of times dioxygenases are used to cleave apart aromatic rings. And remember, we have to use those dioxygenases because the aromatic ring is so stable. Okay, and this is going to be the step where we have the 3 hydroxyanthronylate high enough in energy to where the dioxygenase can cleave it apart. And the enzyme that does this is called 3 hydroxyanthronylate 3,4 dioxygenase. And what we should get out of this is 2 amino 3 carboxymuconate 6 semialdehyde. Okay? And this product right here, this product is the product by which we're going to form something called alpha keto adipate. And alpha keto adipate is going to go into alpha keto adipate catabolism. We will do that in another video. And we'll find that alpha keto adipate is the convergence point between tryptophan catabolism and lysine catabolism, which we will also do in another video. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on going from tryptophan to 2 amino 3 carboxymuconate 6 semialdehyde. And keep in mind that in all these videos that we're doing on the catabolic pathways, we're going to make the assumption that we're in the fasting state. We have low blood glucose. We're going to have glucagon as the prevalent pancreatic hormone. And in other videos, we'll make other cases for maybe what happens when we have insulin present after a high carbohydrate meal. See you in the next video.